Hey, GP learners, and welcome to this live session I've got for you where I'm going to be talking about the various different tech tips that exist for GPs. So many of you have now started working in primary care, and as a result of that, kind of wondering what it's all about, all the various different changes and everything that's happened, and particularly you may be working in practice and thinking, hmm, what can I do to try and save myself a bit of time, a bit of stress, all that kind of stuff? Well, in this session, I'm going to go through all my tech tips for general practice. So various different things we're going to cover. We're going to crack on and stuff. This is a live session. So if you are watching this live, feel free to comment on the side. I'll try my best to answer your questions. I'll probably come through that in, in stages and things. So I will be looking to the side a little bit to try and keep an eye on that. And definitely, if you've got any questions that you want to ask, feel free to do so. We'll try and do that. I'll even be able to bring them on and things. If you are watching this later down the line, make sure you check out the questions and stuff. Feel free to do so. That should be available on the side. And for everybody that's watching, do check out the links in the show notes below because that will link you to various different things I'm going to talk about throughout this as well. Some extra tips, tools, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, let's get started. If you are joining us live, make sure you let us know who you are, where you're from, all that kind of stuff, and tell us what stage you are in general practice as well. Are you ST1, 2, 3, foundation doctor, or a GP that's just finding their feet, or one that's been working for a while and just wanting to know more about what's going on? Definitely let us know. Anyway, let's get started with this little session. So this is my little tech tips for general practice, and effectively, we're going to cover these various different things. So I'm going to talk about communication. I'm going to talk a little bit about remote consultations and stuff, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. I know I've got lots of content for you guys that you can feel free to check out and have a look at that. A little bit about med tech. You guys know I love my little tech tools and stuff. Definitely talking about time. You're going to love that session. And then a little bit about things like apps and things that you may want to consider using in practice and that may save you a bit of time as well. And finally, looking at think two different areas, learning and well-being. And it's really important we think we do talk about well-being. Gel practice is a high pressure environment and it can get really challenging at times. So knowing how to look after yourself, really important. But first and foremost, we're going to talk about communication. And there's various different parts about communication I think is important to, to look at. So one is definitely the whole concept of messaging that occurs within practice and stuff. Um, we're also going to talk about task-based systems and things like that that may help you in practice, and it, particularly in terms of the way that you structure your workflow. And then a little bit about social media, because all my HP learners, you know that I love my social media. And actually, there are ways it can help you in practice, and I'm going to cover that shortly. So firstly, we're talking about communication across the practice itself. And there are various different ways that people do communicate, and particularly with the post-COVID stuff that we're seeing, very different ways of people communicating. One thing I'm going to preface this with is please, please, please do not use WhatsApp for clinical communication. I still know there's lots of people that are thinking about doing this and doing this, and particularly in hospital-based services they do. Don't. It's not secure. It's not safe. And it's definitely not appropriate. We are fortunate, however, to have other systems available to us in general practice that are looking at helping how we look at communication. And MS Teams is definitely one of those things. And with the new procurement advice that we're going to have this at least for the next three years, maybe even longer, um, and how that's going to work locally as well, and the increased functionality that's coming with N365, so that's Microsoft's um, NHS version, then we're going to see a lot of opportunity for practices and for networks and for clinicians and stuff to be able to communicate with what they're doing. So I think it's really important to, to look at how that system works and checking out MS Teams and the functionality it has. Many of you are probably already using it for practice-based meetings and that kind of thing. Many of you are probably using it as chat functions during the consultations. It's important to remember that these things exist and, and can be really useful. And how you use that is obviously partly down to engagement, but also understanding the tech and stuff. So if you want to check that out, feel free to look at the link that's there that shows you how to use the basics of MS Teams. And we've got some awesome content coming for you guys soon that's going to go into that in a lot more detail. There are other systems that can help you in practice, particularly in terms of communications. One we've been using in Nottingham for quite a while now and works really, really well is Clarity TeamNet. And that's a system that allows us to look at storage of documents, looking at protocols, looking at running our meetings and that, and that kind of stuff. And it, it just has everything in one place and it's really useful for using that kind of thing. I think there are other systems worth being aware of. So um, messenger apps like Silo and Pando are really good options if you want to look at clinical discussion through you know, an app interface and definitely more secure than things like WhatsApp. Again, please do not use WhatsApp for clinical discussions. 
it is fine to use from a business sense or arranging things in practice. I know during COVID, we use it a lot to share information about the changes in guidance for COVID within our clinical staff and keeping everybody updated and stuff. That's fine. But patient stuff, no, don't do it. Please don't do it. Please don't do it. I think we've covered that enough. But there are other things worth thinking about. So I'm a big fan of an app called Induction. Feel free to check it out. It's an app that basically gives you the information of all the access points for hospital-based clinicians. It's a shame it doesn't work as well for general practice, but it's a resource that general practice can use. Why? Well, it allows you to crowdsource the information of the right contacts for the various different people working in the hospital. So if you need to speak to cardiologist, you know, Dr. Hart, for example, you can see if he's working at the hospital and then also potentially get his extension number or bleep number through that mechanism. It's a really sensible use of things. And, it, and as I said, it's crowdsourced. So it's, that information is constantly being checked by the people working in those departments. There are other things out as well that allow that. So some of the stuff like Silo and Fort Pando kind of things allow you to do some of that as well and have their own hospital based things in terms of task management. But as a methods of communication, really interesting and really useful to consider. Next up, I wanted to talk about social media. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this is that there are various different Facebook groups in particular that you can look at using to help you in practice. And particularly as you're starting out, there's various different things, questions that people have. And it's sometimes you just feel a bit weird asking them to people that you may be working with or you may be around things that you're working with that you don't feel OK to ask. Well, there's numerous groups. There's groups for everything, let's be honest. And feel free to check them out. So there's a list of them there. If you did want to check out the video that goes into a lot of those in more detail. I'm a big fan of a few of those. I actually run a few of those. So I definitely run the EGP learning group. So you're more than welcome to join me in my group where I kind of support people in terms of all the tech stuff and things. But actually, in terms of general practice, we've got some fairly dedicated groups. So things like GP Survival that looks at supporting practice uh, people in, in GPs in particular around the various different governance stuff and what's right, what's not right, that kind of stuff. Resilient GP is really effective use in terms of helping so the pastoral support for GPs. TCO is very much a good resource for new GPs in particular. And Primary Care UK is just a nice community of people that you can talk with. There's even specific groups for different types of GP. So there's a specific one for GP partners that looks at the elements of partnership. Um, and definitely, if you want to check that out, feel free to do so. Again, the links are there. When it comes to electronic health systems, there's definitely groups out there. Uh, so System One have their own unofficial Facebook group. I know that. I run it. And feel free to join if you want to. But if you do, just make sure you answer the questions because I won't let you in if you don't answer them. But as well, there is one for EMIS, and I'm sure there's others out there for Vision and some of the other groups as well. Talking of other groups, believe it or not, there is a group for GDPR for GPs, and it's awesome. <laughs> okay, it's a bit of a geek in me, but GDPR was one of the most complicated changes that happened in general practice a couple of years ago, and that group has provided so many useful resources for practice to understand a really complex and challenging area. Ardens, Acrix, all these companies that support general practice as well have their own specific groups where you can share and get resources, and particularly those two groups are really good at feedback for practices and for individuals working in primary care and if you've got a question inevitably if you ask it in there you'll probably get a reasonably good and quick answer much better sometimes than their own inbuilt support like this if you want a little bit of fun feel free to check out my board game medics group which you're more than welcome to have a look at if you want to what can i say i love my board games Next up, we're going to talk about a different kind of area in terms of the types of communication. It's important to remember that when we do use social media, it's nice to have a bit of guidance and a bit of structure in terms of how you do that. So make sure you do look at that. And um, particularly if you are new to using social media, there are a few rules and particularly as doctors, I'm afraid there's an extra few requirements in terms of how we use social media that you need to abide by. Do not want to be in front of the GMC for using social media inappropriately. Remote consultations is something that's massively exploded over the past six months. There is no doubt that COVID has changed general practice. And in particular, with remote consultations is one of the areas that's had the most significant impact. As I said, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this. I've got this in other content, which I'll show you shortly. But just a quick few tips that I would definitely recommend people consider. So number one is always be prepared. Um, if you're new to remote consultations, whether that's online consultations, telephone consultations or video consultations, it's important to know about the different things that you know to consider. So where am I going to be doing it? 
what kind of systems am I using? Make sure you've had a play and a test of those systems before you actually start doing it properly and understand the workflows in particular that come with those. So, for example, if I need to book a patient in to come and see somebody, whether it's myself or somebody else in the practice, what does that look like? Know that before you get to the point of having to do that. And if it's not explained in your induction and stuff, these are the questions you need to be asking because you do not want to be in that situation where you don't know because that will cause you stress. You may get it wrong. That will cause the patient more stress. And that will inevitably then, unfortunately, risk the elements of complaints and that kind of stuff. And that's things that can be so easily dealt with just by asking a few questions at the start and having a test of these kind of systems. When you're actually doing video consultations, know where you're looking. So right now I'm looking straight at you because I'm looking at the camera. I'm not looking at my screen. And if you don't think that's an issue, well, look, check out the next time you do a WhatsApp call or something like that with somebody. How long is it before you end up not really paying attention because you're looking at the screen, not yourself, not the person, and the engagement isn't as effective? It's interesting to think about. When I do consultations, I insist on having my little tool here, which is my little headset, um, and that allows me to hear better and also allows the patients and stuff to hear me better. I've got one for my computer for video consultations. I've got a separate one that plugs directly into my phone for telephone. If you're using a soft phone system, you may only need the one, but I would highly recommend this is probably one of the best tips that you can have when you're doing remote consultations. The other thing is you don't hear the keyboard as much, so you're more likely to type during the consultation, which will save you time. Make sure you've got a method of managing interruptions. I'm so far I'm lucky I've not had anybody call me whilst I'm here. But understanding how you're going to look at managing interruptions during when you are doing things like telephone and video consultations is really important because actually they can happen for good reasons and sometimes for frustrating ones. But understanding that mechanism is really important. Don't be afraid about remote consultation. I know for some it fills them with anxiety, fills them with dread. It's not what's comfortable. And they are different to face-to-face -face consultations absolutely we we lose a lot of the th you know the, the non-verbal communication potential when we're doing things by telephone and even by video it is different because we're almost like people are performing you know often we have to host patients in terms of how they use the systems we have to onboard them there's different skills that you need when it comes to remote consultation and particularly video but that's not something to be afraid of it's also important to make sure that you're not afraid to say what you need to do. So just because you've had to change your consultation from an online to a telephone and then to a video, and actually the safest way of doing this is then to change that to a face-to-face, -face, don't be afraid to say that's what needs to happen. It may be a more complicated journey that's happened for that patient. It may have been more workload for yourself, but if that's the best thing that's for the patient, then that is the best thing that needs to happen. And if at the start, it needs to be a face-to-face -face consultation because that patient's needs are in such that that's what's needed, do it. Don't feel that you have to run everything by telephone. Don't feel you have to run everything by video, whatever. Make sure you pick the right consultation that works for both the patients and for yourself to have the best opportunity to make it better for everybody. So if you did want extra resources and stuff, feel free to check out these various different videos and playlists and stuff that I've got various amounts. So we've got things like online consultations for you, tips for video consultation in more detail, how you can do examinations by video consultations. And I'm a massive fan of the platform called Accurix. We've got various different videos to show you how you can make that easier for yourself and for patients. If you are watching this live and you don't want to go to the show notes, just hold your camera over this QR code. It'll take you straight to the page that has all of these on it, and you can access them from there if you want to. If you like that, let me know what you think. I'd love to hear in the comments what you think about things. If you've got any questions on other kind of videos you'd love to see, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear them. MedTech. So MedTech is something I love. And one of my favorite tools at the moment right now is looking at the humble stethoscope plus, shall we say. So what am I talking about? Well, I've got one right here. Let's have a little look, shall we? There we are. Apologies. Right here. So this is a Bluetooth stethoscope. It's the Echo Core 2. Um, and it is an awesome piece of kit. Why? Well, the stethoscope is a humble piece of gear. It's typical, it's iconic of general practice, but it's not really had an upgrade. And it's amazing how something as simple as a little Bluetooth piece here yeah, makes such a difference. Um, so I've recently been having a good go at this and I've got a video coming out shortly that shows how effective this kind of kit can be. But simply this little extra little attachment does two amazing things. 
One, it allows active noise cancelling to be in use. Um, so those of you who have used noise cancelling headphones before and seen the difference that you can have, it, it's like going you know, from HD TV to standard TV. It's the difference. You don't notice it until you've done it. It's amazing. But additionally, this allows you to transmit sound. So you can either record it or transmit it elsewhere. And particularly in a COVID situation, this has shown real benefits. So, for example, in high risk areas, you can actually have the patient or somebody supporting the patient, like in care homes in particular. And I feel that's where one of the significant uses of this kind of kit is, can be used to help support the patients without the clinician physically having to go to places. So from an infection control perspective, really useful and really effective and because of that transmission of sound you can hear very clearly it still has the active noise cancelling in there and as well if it needs in, at some point a referral so if you've got a weird sound, heart sound that you want the clarity on you can even ask cardiologists for their input by sending them the sounds if need be i do really really like this and they've got an additional model that's coming out uh, already out sorry called the echo geo so we'll be looking at that soon as well and one of the best things I can ever recommend that you have as a new GP, and this is going to sound weird, it's going to sound simple, keep a charger cable with you. Why? Well, I often do long potential days in practice, not only because I do my clinical work, but because I do all this extra stuff for you guys as well. And having your battery die out on you is not fun. Um, having plugs and stuff is a bit more cumbersome, but keeping a cable with you, particularly a triple cable, so I like the ones that have um, three different parts to them, yeah, uh, you know, the, the micro USB, uh, USB-C and the iPhone one, really useful. Definitely become people's friends at conferences and that kind of stuff. It's useful to have. And I just find it makes my life a lot easier. So definitely a top tip for me is make sure you've got one of those in your bag, a triple cable in particular. And feel free to have a look at that if you want. And time. So I, I love talking about time. I'm a time lord is starry. I love being able to help people with it when it comes to time. And there are so many ways you can improve your time in practice. And I'm going to cover a quick few options of those. So number one is tracking your time. So you can't know where to improve things unless you have an idea of what time looks like and where you're spending your time. So there's two things I definitely recommend people consider when we're looking at tracking time. Number one is a simple app called Clockify. So it's a web-based app you can either stick on your computer or you can have it on your phone if you want to. And it just lets you, in a couple of clicks, track the time that you're doing. So I've done this every few months. I do a little mini audit of what I'm spending my time on. So whether that's face-to-face -face patient work, whether that's um, telephone work, whether that's admin, whether that's you know other kind of stuff. And that information lets me figure out why am I spending this much time doing telephones when I shouldn't really be? When am I spending so much time doing this amount of admin? Uh, is that the best thing for me? And that's really useful to know. And that's information that you can get because once you start tracking it, you can then know where you potentially need to make those changes. So particularly if you're finding you're doing loads of admin work, why am I doing loads of admin work? Why is this happening? Well, how do I need to change things and stuff? So if you're interested in having a look at that, do check it out. It's a really useful app. And particularly for those who have multiple jobs, portfolio, careers, and that kind of stuff, it can be a really useful way of keeping that metric information. I've recently covered a handy little piece of kit as well. So this is something called a time cube. It's a really simple device. It is a timer. And you can set the time for whatever you want. As you can see there, 2, 5, 15 minutes. There is a version that comes with 10 minutes. So useful, for, obviously, for some consultations. Simply click it on, it flashes a color, you want it to start. There you go, it goes green. And when it's 50% down the time frame, it goes to amber. And when it's 10% left, it goes red. And when it's finished, it starts flashing red. I'm not gonna do that now. Check out the video if you wanna see it. But in particularly in terms of GP trainee support and time in that side of things, I think it's a really useful tool that can help people understand where they are in the consultation time frames. Well, is a time important? Things are changing. It's different. But unfortunately, the RCA and the CSA exams still require you to consult within 10 minutes. So that is somewhere where it can be really effective and useful. Other things when it comes to time, I'm a big fan of being able to sort out what you need to do. So delegating, figuring out what you need to give to other people. There's loads of apps out there that can help you do that. I'm a big fan of an app called Ike. And when it comes to automating your schedule, figuring out how you can work more effectively. So there's a platform I love to use called Harmonizely that helps me schedule my time 
so easily. So if somebody needs my time, I don't say, when are you free? When are we free? All that kind of stuff. I simply send them the link and say, this is when I'm free. Book it in whenever suits you. Um, and occasionally I'll give some people the, the extra special links to get additional time and things. But that's based on what I need to do. And that's especially useful when you've got multiple different hats or particularly when you've got only specific days where you can do the different roles and things. And that's really useful potentially for locums. Um, so it can be a mechanism for you to do some of that work. I think there are other platforms that do some of that a little bit more effectively and combine other things. So platforms like uh, Lantern, platforms like My Local Manager, really useful platforms that can help streamline your working day as locums and definitely worth checking out if you're interested in having that complete picture of things. Things like Harmonizely are really good if you're a control freak um, and like myself, I'll be honest, I, I love that. But also if you only need that function, if you need the wider stuff, particularly pension forms, all that kind of stuff, definitely things like My Local Manager can help sort out a lot of that for you. When it comes to understanding how to use your time, though, if you want some more productivity tips and stuff, check out the video down below that you can see. But one of my best ones that I recommend to many people is the concept of something called the Pomodoro technique or timer. And this is simply that the human brain works really effectively for short bursts of time. So working for 25 minutes in a row and then having a five minute break can significantly improve your productivity. And what I suggest people do with this is think when it comes to your admin tasks in particular, so batching it, so spend, have a set time frame where in this 25 minutes and this 25 minutes only, I'm gonna do my prescriptions and letters, for example, and that's it. You don't touch it another time. And the really useful thing with that is you get into the workflow of doing that particular task. So your brain works more effectively and you're just condensing it into one part of your day rather than constantly going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, checking how oh, I've got an extra result. I'm going to deal with that. Oh, it's a bit more complicated. It's taking me more time than I planned. And now I've got something else happening. Now I'm running behind. No. Take a breath. Relax. And make sure you structure your day in terms of batch timing. It will make your life so much more easier. Yes. There's inevitably uh, for times, particularly when you're on call, going to be situations where they intrude on your schedule, but trying to condense the tasks that you're doing into structured, designated timeframes will increase your productivity and reduce your stress so significantly. So do check that out if you want to have a look at it. In terms of other options, time, well, one of the best ways and hands down one of the most effective ways I have found to make people work quicker, getting them to type quicker. Yeah. And um, so the speed at which you can type does determine how quickly you will function in general practice, because most of our interface work is with patients and it's with the clinical system for us to document everything. So if you can type quicker, you will work quicker. And if you want a tool that will help you do that, maybe speaking, teaching, typing stuff is all well and good. Me personally, I must admit, Keybar is the thing for me. It's, it's a simple website. You dial in and simply you start typing. And the muscle memory that it helps you learn can significantly improve your typing speed. So I went from 30 words a minute to about 45. And just by doing five minutes a day, it's surprising how much improvement you can have. And I've reduced the time it takes me to do things by almost 50% when it comes to documenting my notes and stuff. So definitely check that out. Other kind of tips. Well, I'm a big fan of apps and there's various different apps I would highly recommend to anybody, anybody working in primary care. And this hands down is the top one. BNF in my view is the must download clinical app for any GP. The book is useful. It's the compendium of all the clinical information that we have. Some of the clinical systems have these in built in, but at the end of the day, the BNF is the ultimate resource when it comes to prescribing, which is a significant portion of our workload. Well, the benefit of the app is that, well, it's got various benefits. Number one, it's a lot lighter than the book. Number two, it's constantly and updated to be effective. So in terms of a few years ago, um, one of the problems with the BNF was that they published the wrong doses for erythromycin and had to send around memos and letters to every single person afterwards to say the doses were wrong. Now, I don't know the clinical implications of that, whether there was mistakes or not, and it's really hard to track that but it's possible that could have happened. The benefit of an app, the moment they realize it is a problem, they update it, it's fixed, no issues. You know that everybody will there from that point on have the correct information. And number three, you can switch from the adult BNF to the child BNF with a click. That's awesome. No more carrying around big, heavy books. 
no more having to search through the really complicated thing to find the thing because you can just type in the name. So if you need to know the drug doses for bruzamide for a particular patient with a GFR of this range, gets us straight to the page, it gives you the information, you're sorted. How amazing is that? How simple is that? But it is, in my view, one of the best clinical apps available and should be on the phone of every single person. There are loads of other really cool apps from Talkspace down to FODMAPs to down to various other things. But the BNF app, in my view, is the most download app for any clinician. But what about if you want to give apps to patients? We're increasingly seeing more of this, the digital working that many of us are doing across general practice and prescribing apps. There are loads of apps that we can use for patients. And particularly in the COVID world, we've seen that, you know, digital support for patients is a massive thing. Well, we talked about the BNF being the clinical resource for doctors. Well, if you're wanting the similar sort of thing for the apps, check out Orca. So Orca is an organization. So the Organization for Care and Review of Healthcare Apps. And effectively, they are the BNF for health apps. It's the easiest way of thinking about it. It's easy to use. It's quick to use. It's free to use if you want to check out some of the stuff. There are some paid elements if you want to use them. But in terms of searching the content, it gives you the information about the different types of apps, the complexities of the various different things, like the updated version, how accurate is it, how which system does it work on, what does the interface look like, all those kind of information that you can then analyze and then suggest. And you'll find the ones that work best for you and the ones that work best for your patients. You can share that information. So definitely check out Orca. What do you think? Have you ever prescribed an app to a patient? Is that something that you would do? Let me know in the comments if it is. I'd love to know. In fact, let's ask, shall we? Would you prescribe an app to a patient? And then next up we've got, well, I'd love to show you probably the, the best stress saving tool I've ever come across. And it's simply a password manager. Why? Well, in general practice, we unfortunately are lumbered with the fact that we have multiple different systems that all have multiple different password requirements that may change in some cases on a fairly frequent basis and keeping track of that. Ugh, so much stress. Really stressful, isn't it? You know, imagine you've gone away from holiday and you come back and you've forgotten your passwords. Has that ever happened to you? Mm -hmm. I guarantee you it will at some point. There will be a password that you forget. Well, having a password locker app like LastPass, and that's the one that I use, to be honest, they are amazing. They can be so time-saving and you can be so secure. They can help you to clarify the type of information that you want to store, the different passwords, the usernames, all that kind of stuff. When you have it on your computer, you can even, with a couple of clicks, do a lot of that stuff as well. EHRs, it doesn't work as integrated, obviously, because that's a different system, but you can still access it through your phone or through the website in terms of app and passwords and things that you need. And you can even, if you go for the higher level functions and stuff, have it set so that it only works in particular locations. So adding that extra security and things or two-factor authentication. If you're interested in checking that out, look at the link here. It gives you some access and it is free to use. And to be honest, the, the free package is all you need. Um, you don't have to pay for this at all. And for many years, I've used the free one. The only reason I upgraded is because I want some extra security. But as I said, the free option is all you need in general practice in order to use this effectively. And I would really, really recommend using this as a method to save yourself so much stress. And this is just from the work perspective. When you include this in your home lives, oh, my God, you may never have to remember about password again. The only thing one you have to remember is that one master password, which you can make super secure. I've got some links if you want in the show notes to show you how to do that as well. Next up, we're talking about well-being. So we talked about how LastPass can help save you stress. Well, let's be honest, over the past few months, many of us have experienced significant stress levels trying to deal with the whole COVID situation and the impact that's had on many of us. I think it's really important to remember that, you know, taking time out for ourselves is a valid thing. And there's some really awesome tools out there to help you do that from an app perspective in particular. One I, I really like and have found useful is an app called Sleepio. Um, and I do recommend to many patients and is actually one of the few apps that has been evaluated by NICE and recommended by them for use with patients as well. So it's really interesting. Uh, and even myself did a review of this almost two years ago. And still to this date, there are very few apps that have been registered and evaluated by NICE as an option. 
And it's just a really good way of giving sleep advice, but it's effective because it's tailored to the person and it gives additional tools to help that person understand how to improve their sleep. And I've had numerous patients who have come back to me and found that it has given them real benefit with trying to sort out their sleep. Because we know that drugs don't work in the long run. They're a short-term fix and they shouldn't often be used. And if you do, they can lead to issues with addiction and other challenges that come with those medications. Well, sleepio is a great way of looking at that and I'm a massive, massive fan of it. Shiny Minds is a health and well-being app that I think is really useful. Um, I've used it myself. And we have it provided for us in the Nottinghamshire area. And if you're interested, check out the links there in terms of how it can benefit you and what it can do. It is important your area has to have had it. So that is one proviso with Shiny Minds. Um, and it is worth exploring whether or not your area has invested in that resource. If not, Calm and Headspace are two awesome apps that also offer similar sort of things. I do think Shiny Minds is a little bit more prescriptive um, in terms of the way it can work elaboratively for you um, but I think it works really really well from my perspective and it's the one I seem prefer although I do chop and change between that and headspace because headspace is really easy to use that's the cool thing and again one I've recommended to many patients because of the nice graphics and the simplicity of simply headphones on press play off you go and if you want something to just help a little bit more with the productivity and the focus because it's a challenge for many of us. Forest is a nice little app that basically blocks your phone, stops you using it whilst the app's on. Because And the idea is you're trying to grow a tree whilst the app is on. If you leave that app, you kill the tree. Don't kill the tree. That's not nice. We're not kill tree killers here. Um, but it's, it's a simple premise, but it works. And obviously, we know that engagement with phones, too much technology and stuff is a challenge for many people, particularly social media. Yeah, it's net plugged into my brain. But definitely, it's important to make sure you've got time out and stuff. And lastly, we're coming to learning. So for many new GPs that are out there, the RCA is the new process that they are having to go through. And if you do need some information about that, whichever role you're in, check out this video that talks through the different processes when it comes to it. Um, and feel free to have a look at that in more detail. I think it's really useful to understand the process. And there is lots of content out there to support you. But when it comes to learning itself, I think there are other options as well. So I'm a big fan of notepad apps. So whether that's things like Evernote or Google Drive, having some method that's automated and backed up means that you don't lose your notes, which is really important. If you're more pen and paper person, definitely check out something called bullet journaling. It's a much better way, I think, of using pen and paper and lists and that kind of stuff to, in effect, digitize your analog stuff. Um, but if you've got information that you want to save and store and you don't want to dial into your ePortfolio all the time to do that, check out WakeClick. It's a nice little tool that allows you to store that content from whatever platforms you've worked. And especially for things like social media, it works really well, but also standard websites. And you can save it to a repository that then when it comes to sharing that within your ePortfolio, whether it's for your training or for your appraisal, you just simply share the link and it's all there. The evidence is there in terms of what you've done, what you've checked out and what you've used. And different ways of learning. So I'm a massive fan of podcasts. I have my own podcast, for example, and you're welcome to listen to that. But when it comes to clinical stuff, actually, there are, I'll be honest, better ones around there. And if you want to check out the list, feel free to have a look at that list that's on that video just there. Again, the link to that is right down in the show notes. And on YouTube, there's so many different ways you can learn things through the benefit of YouTube or other video platforms like that. What am I talking about? Well, I, I learned how to do Epley's and Dick's Hallpike Maneuver through YouTube. And I teach people how to do it through YouTube. My trainees, I make them watch the videos because actually that's the best way to demonstrate how to do things. In fact, Google and YouTube do this. You know, if you want to find out how do I, the search result inevitably have a video right at the top in terms of how to do it. So you use the video platforms and many of our guides are out there to help support you in terms of doing this. That's one of the reasons why I create this content. It's how do you do things? differently, better, all that kind of stuff. So feel free to check that out and things. If you do want more information that are specifically for those that have finished general practice, um, I think there are various different questions that many people have. And when they're starting their new practice roles and stuff, definitely check out these videos. So these are videos I've created with the GP task force in Derbyshire, five well-constructed videos that go through various different aspects of general practice and how to be a bit more resilient, looking after your well-being. Um, the acronyms of general practice, which are confusing and complex and various among them that you will want to check out. Um, 
financial advice and also appraisal and revalidation or that one will have some new extra stuff because obviously revalidation and appraisal has been paused currently but about to restart so worth checking out if this is something new that you have to deal with and i hope you found this useful egp learners because there's lots of different information and stuff and if you do want that information feel free to check down below in the show notes um, going to have a look at the questions and comments we've had. So thank you, Darren, for yours. You mentioned about some very useful apps as well. So let's have a look at that. So yeah, PFR, Asthma apps, and the FODMAPs that in particular I found really useful. So there's a couple of apps I do recommend to patients because access to our dietitian support can be taking a while at times, and, and that's irrespective of the COVID side of things. So having patients have useful information and stuff they can look at. Well, there's a couple. So I, I like the fast food FODMAPs one. There's also the Monash app as well um, that looks and it gives you, you know, you can scan the food and it gives you an idea of what type of FODMAPs are in that food so then the patient can help make better informed decisions. And I find those kind of things, yeah, just really useful and stuff. I'm happy to answer any questions. In the meantime, whilst we wait for those to come through, I think it's really useful for many people to understand that tech can really help you in general practice. Um, it can at times be scary can at times be challenging and sometimes let's be honest it doesn't work you know we've had numerous instances where the tech has timed out where it's been a problem all that kind of stuff but overall tech can really help us in general practice and you know if there are other ways that you've come across where tech can help you feel free to share them i'd love to hear about your experiences and things that you come across that's often how much of my content comes about i learn about things through other people I've got loads of content coming for you guys soon and in particular feel free to check out some of our um, YouTube videos that we've got coming up. Each week, there will be a regular webinar like this that goes over various different um, platforms and ideas and things that you may need to think about. In addition, I'll be doing some extra teaching shortly with things like the digital um, uh, 21st GP um, uh, webinar plan with Lantern, as well as upcoming soon, we've got our own digital primary care conference, which hopefully you guys will find really interesting and engaging in terms of showing you the breadth and depth of things that happen in general practice from a digital perspective uh, yeah i'm definitely looking forward to that we've got some headline speakers that you will not want to miss for that particular event um but overall as always if you've got any comments or questions happy to answer them i appreciate we don't have any live but if you've got any after the fact and let them down in the show notes i will definitely check them out and respond fairly quickly and if not feel free to contact me on whichever platform you prefer whether that's um, twitter linkedin facebook on all of those if you are watching us on youtube i'm sure there's another video that's going to be recommending for you coming up right here and if not, um, feel free to check out this other video that I've got right here that talks about some other tips and tools and particularly some tech things that you're definitely going to want to check out when it comes to med tech and stuff. As always, EGP leaders, I'm here to try and help. Um, definitely let us know if you've got any comments or questions. And as always, EGP Learning is here to help save you and your patients' time by taking hands in your primary care and learning. Catch you soon.